My name is Kathleen Traphagan, and I am the co-facilitator of the Ed Funders Out of School Time Impact Group. And I've got Rebecca Goldberg, my, my co-facilitator here. She's going to be um, monitoring the chat and overall, you know, solving issues as they come up. So um, welcome everybody. So um, our subject for today is the um, how the out of school time field is serving young people with disabilities and intersectional identities. Um, and we've been wanting to, to take this up for a while. Um, and I definitely will start out by saying that this is not the only time that we are going to be taking this up. Um, but we are starting the conversation, at least in this forum today. Um, so we're going to talk with national leaders that we have on the on the line here and also young people um, and direct service professionals and explore what does inclusion of children and youth with disabilities look like in the out of school space now? What are bright spots? What are ongoing challenges and trends in the field? What are implications for the work that we do? And what are effective actions for philanthropy? So um, and again, make sure that you uh, get yourself involved in the conversation as much as possible by using the chat, and hopefully we'll also have time to um, let the folks that want to unmute and comment and question. So let's start out by um, introducing each other and ourselves in the chat. Um, your name, your organization, your pronouns, and the question is um, what steps your organization has taken or would like to take to better support inclusion with for youth with disabilities. Um, and that goes for whatever role you have in this um, conversation, whether you're a funder, a provider, however you, you um, enter this, we'd love to hear um, what you have done and what it is that you'd like to do. So, um, you know, we know that since the onset of the pandemic, the um, needs of children and youth with disabilities have increased just like they have um, for children and youth all over. Um, the capacity of providers at the same time to meet those needs has diminished with staff shortages and stress, burnout, increase in turnover. Um, and so definitely a challenging space to be in right now. But as usual, there are lots of bright spots because the folks in this field are creative, innovative, constantly meeting kids where they are and solving problems. Um, so we're gonna hear about that today. So the first part of, of our agenda is to talk with Tori Dunlap and Ebony Watson. Um, and they both come at this um, from different uh, perspectives and um, different ways to approach. And so um, I'm gonna first call on Ebony and Tori um, each to introduce themselves and their organization by telling us how you came into this work, what's your why for being in this work, and describe what you do, um, what your goals are, and um, how you define with disabilities. Um, so let's start out with Ebony. Ebony Watson is the Deputy Director of Workforce Development at IEL, and um, she's going to be discussing that, that role and also uh, the RAMP program specifically. So I'm going to turn it over uh, to Ebony. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so my my why is always an interesting why. Um, so I started my career as a juvenile probation officer in Baltimore City. And um, while a probation officer, I was approached in 2009 to become a mentor for the Ready to Achieve Mentoring Program. And um, one of the things that I really liked about the model, and I'm going to go into more detail about it, is the fact that it actually, um, it, it, it could essentially put me out of a job. Um, as a probation officer, I realized how many of my clients on my caseload did not have the support that they needed, particularly in school. Um, they had undiagnosed or diagnosed disabilities, but instead of the school actually supporting them, they turned to the justice system to penalize them. So they wanted me to make something happen, remove them from the school when really what they needed was support with their um, individualized education plan. And that is, I believe, one of the main reasons that far too many youth get sucked into the system 
when what they really need is support and resources so that they too can be successful. So in working with RAMP, I saw the benefits of youth participating in a program that helped them understand disability and their rights all while preparing them for a successful future outside of the juvenile justice system. So the Institute for Educational Leadership or IEL creates opportunities for success in education and workforce development for children, youth, adults, and families in communities where opportunities are lacking. And since 1991, IEL has been focused on career pathways and working with, <clears throat> excuse me, working with community-based organizations, schools and districts and state and federal agencies to support outcomes for youth, including those opportunity youth and youth with disabilities, with a focus on the transition to adulthood. And IEL staff has a deep expertise in out of school time, youth leadership development, mentoring, disability inclusion, and transition age services. And we have promoted awareness of what all youth, including youth with disabilities, need to successfully transition to employment and or post-secondary education. And the Ready to Achieve Mentoring Program, or RAMP, is a program model that IEL created in 2009 to address those needs of youth that were often forgotten. So RAMP is a career-focused mentoring program for youth with disabilities. And for our definition of youth with disabilities, these are youth that have a 504 plan, an individualized education plan, a mental health diagnosis, low test scores, pretty much how the Americans with Disabilities Act defines disability. All those youth are eligible for the program. Um, but also that have involvement with or are at risk of involvement with the juvenile justice system. And it is currently being implemented in 16 communities across the country. RAMP utilizes group mentoring where youth participate in weekly career focus sessions led by the RAMP coordinators at each site on topics such as the local labor market research, career and post-secondary exploration, social and work readiness skills training, resume creation, interviews, skill building, and learning about disability disclosure. And then peer mentoring, where the youth set weekly goals that are supported by their peers. This has been one of the strongest component amongst the RAMP site. So youth use what we call their weekly goal tracking sheet, which is designed to assist youth in setting and achieving short-term weekly goals that align to the long-term goals they set in their individualized mentoring plans. And youth are supporting their peers in creating meaningful goals with suggestions on how to get to those goals and they are holding their peers accountable for those goals. And the last part is one-to-one -one mentoring. So youth are assigned to a caring adult at a four-to-one ratio. So no more than four youth to one mentor where they work together to complete their individualized mentoring plans, which helps the youth and mentors identify the youth's strengths and their areas for growth and provides a structure for the youth and the mentor to work on setting and achieving short and long-term goals and how to build relationships within the community to promote that successful transition to employment and continued learning opportunities and independent living. So since 2009, um, there have been over 4,300 youth across 34 communities enrolled in the program. We have recruited over 800 mentors and established over 1,500 community partners. Um, we work with community-based organizations, vocational rehabilitation agencies, schools, and centers for independent living to implement the RAMP program. And over the years, we've had great outcomes to include a 95% participation and completion rate, 74% improved school attendance, 95% non-offense rate. Remember I said in the beginning, I was a probation officer, so that's what's putting me out of a job, that non-offense rate. 
88% mentor participation, which is due to the coordinators properly training the mentors and providing that ongoing support to mentors to make sure they feel included. And then 70% increased social support. So the youth were able to identify supports in their school and community. Um, and now um, over the years, this is going into year 14 of RAMP, we have RAMP alumni who are now underwater welders, first generation college students and graduates, business owners, IT specialists, chefs, and it's because of the exposure that they receive while in the RAMP program. Um, and I think the quote on here sums it up, like it is really much a program that helps kids figure out what they want to do in their life. Um, these are often kids that are, are forgotten about and utilizing an individualized approach for each youth, finding out what they are interested in and what they need is the key to success of the program. And I guess this is just my contact information and I do want to um, also highlight that our conference in June will be happening in June and we will have an out of school time strand and I will stop. Great, that's awesome. Thank you so much. And I see you've got a, a question in the chat but I, I think maybe you could answer it in the chat. Um, and we will also have time to circle back for more conversation. Um, but that is, um, and I love how you, I love how you connected it to your personal why and then came back and mentioned that you all are achieving those outcomes that you know are really the thing that drove you to be there in the beginning. Um, awesome. And, and later in the hour, we're going to talk to a few young people who are with us now um, who have experience being in the RAMP program. So thanks, Ebony. Um, so we're going to turn to Tori Dunlap. Um, Tori is the CEO of Kids Included Together. Uh, and I will let Tori explain uh, kids included together, what you do, and um, your own why. So, um, Tori, take it away. Happy to be here. Happy to do it. In the mid-90s, I ran an after-school theater arts program, and a 10-year-old boy with Down syndrome enrolled in my beginning acting class. I was terrified. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know if I could do it. I didn't know very much about Down syndrome. And his mom told me that there was this small nonprofit in town called Kids Included Together, or KIT, and that if I reached out to them, they would help me. And the executive director came to my classroom, modeled for me, told me about all the wonderful KIT trainings. I took every training that I could. And including this student in an acting class changed how I teach, it changed my worldview, it changed every student in the classroom, and it made me an advocate for disability inclusion. So I joined the KIT team in 2003 as a part-time program coordinator, and I became the CEO in 2012. And my why was really to help other people learn what I had learned and how to do it. And now Kids Included Together has taught disability inclusion and behavior support practices to almost 150,000 providers and teachers working in over 700 programs located in all 50 states and 15 countries. And this is our definition of disability. This is based on the World Health Organization's um, conceptualization of disability plus um, researchers in the field of disability studies and, and particularly a perspective on disability, disability in childhood. So we see it as an interaction between health, environmental, and personal factors, and that disability is really context dependent. So an example of that is that a child's asthma might affect participation in youth sports and accommodations are needed. For another child, it might be difficulty interacting with other children that is affecting his experience in the out of school time program. So we're really looking at disability in this way. And it's also important to note that no diagnosis is required for it to provide um, support to the provider. We're a provider-centered support model, but they, children do not have to have any diagnosis. We work with many organizations around the country, and some of them are listed here. Um, Boys and Girls Clubs of America, YMCAs around the country, large after-school programs like Alphabest Education, Head Start in several states, 
and state after school networks like NJ SAC. We have a representative here today with us and all the military child and youth programs on every military installation around the world. And we use a blended learning model. So we embed ourselves within an organization over a period of years with a goal that training and support becomes a seamless part of their operations. We do, we create inclusive policies for our clients and we develop custom curriculum to teach those policies to the staff. We deliver over 600 training events per year. We have a very unique service that's a call-in coaching center staffed by qualified inclusion and behavior specialists where our providers can call and ask for help if they need it for a specific situation. And we have an online learning platform called Kid Academy with hundreds of interactive e-modules and printable resources. We have an in-house team of highly qualified experts who all have worked in early childhood and OST programs, and we see ourselves as friendly, helpful guides on the path to inclusion. We have a lot of positive outcomes from our model, but I'm just going to share two. One is that 94% of our learners report increased confidence in serving children with disabilities after a kit training. And the second one is decreased level of concern. So when people call our inclusion support center, more than half of the callers report a high level of concern before the call and 22% um, after the call. So a lot of help and support from our support center. And finally, um, we know from the research literature that when that the biggest predictor of inclusion is whether staff had have had training on disability or inclusion. So we know that out of school time staff with training are more likely to serve children with disabilities. They're more comfortable and confident providing accommodations and they have more positive thoughts about inclusion. And I will end there. Terrific. Thank you. Um, so thank you both for giving us that introduction to two different ways um, that you're both uh, approaching. The, the, sorry, can you can you hear? Your, is your um, audio good, Tori? Okay, good, good. I'm back now. Um, sorry about that. AirPods fail. No, it's all it's the technology gods, and sometimes they're <laughs> smiling, and sometimes they're not. Um, so it looks like they're back smiling with you, which is great. Um, so what I really loved about that is that it's a completely different approach, um, from ramp, um, but there's really quite a lot of consistencies too, um, with the way that you're with, with the way that you're thinking about the work. Um, and what I'd like to do, I want to, we're going to have time to circle back because I have so many questions for both of you. I'm sure we'll run out of time, but I do first want to bring, a, uh, three more people into the conversation. So we, as much as possible, um, like to talk to folks who are uh, proximate. That's a buzzword these days, but there is something to it. So we've got um, for Tori, we have Becca Gutworth, who um, is a provider that has worked with Kids Included together. And um, with Ebony, we have Alan Brizuela, who is a um, alum of the RAMP program. And we have Maya Roundtree, who's a current student in the RAMP program. So let's start out with Ebony in conversation with Alan and Maya, um, and Alan and Maya will get a chance to introduce themselves um, and hear about the experiences that you've had in the RAMP program and how um, you have taken those um, you know, in other areas of your life as well. So I'm turning it to Ebony for a bit, and then we'll come back and we'll hear from Tori um, and Becca. All right, thank you. Um, so, for Alan and Maya, I want to start first um, with you all introducing yourself, where you live, and um, the name of the RAMP program that you are in, well, the area. I'm Maya Roundtree. Um, I live in Florida, Georgia, and my RAMP program is in Clarendon High School in Georgia. Okay. And Alan? And my name is Alan Brizuela, and I am part of the RAM program here in Houston, Texas. All right. So starting with you first, Alan, how did you learn about the RAM program? Um, it was back when I was a 
sophomore in high school. Um, Jackie Miller just came uh, came into the school and uh, talked to the person in charge of the special ed uh, program in, at the school. And yeah, that's just how we, how everything started for me. And who is Jackie? Can you tell them who Jackie Miller? Oh, she's uh, the ramp coordinator here in Houston. She she goes to the school. Okay. And when um, they talked about the program, did you have any reservations about joining the program? What did you think about the program? No, um, I was very interested in it because I was, I was always wondering what I would do after I graduated because I, I, I had no clue. I really didn't know what I wanted to do as a career. So and, when so when she came in, I was at and she started talking about it. It it start, it um it, it got me thinking about what what I wanted to do. So it it helped me think about stuff. So what are um some of the things that you all did um that helped you think about it? Like what did you gain from participating? Um, she just. First, she started with um, how to how to conduct ourselves in an interview, how to present yourself in an interview, and then she uh, took us to some field trips to some places to see how they worked and stuff. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, she just talked about how how we can pers- better present ourselves in a work environment. Okay. Um, what would you say to a young person considering participating in a in ramp? That they should, because it's going to open their mind and thought process on what they might want to do after high school or during high school in a part time job, just so they can get experience. So you said that it helps you figure out, you said in the beginning that you didn't know what you wanted to do. Yeah. Um, since RAMP, do you know what you want to do? And what is it exactly that you're doing now? I am looking into trying into becoming a sports agent, like a general manager or something like that. Okay. And where are you currently, what are you, what is, what are you currently doing now? Are you current, currently employed? Yes, I I work for Easter Seals Raider Houston. I am part of the respite team. I am the respite data uh, assistant. So I just call the the respite clients and uh, tell them if ask ask them to put the hours that their respite worker has worked uh, during the month. That's that's what I do. I just call clients and ask them to put hours in. And can you share with everyone the significance of the fact that you're working at Easter Seals Greater Houston? Um, it's just a great community, uh, a great uh, organization to work with because it helps everything. It, it actually is what I wanted to do, which is help people that's what I like to do I like to help people and this helps me understand and find other ways to helping people so it it's just helped me um, reach out to the community more okay and I'll share what he is not saying that I'm trying to get him to say is that Easter Seals Greater Houston is the site that implements the Ready to Achieve Mentoring Program. So he was a youth that participated in RAMP at Easter Seals Greater Houston, and they saw something in him and his progress and success, and they have now hired him to work at um, the organization while pursuing um, his ultimate goal in being a sports agent. So thank you, Alan, for sharing. Now, Maya, I'm going to turn to you. How did you learn about the RAMP program? Uh, I learned about the RAMP program in ninth grade. 
I was in a classroom that I wasn't supposed to be in. I was in there to talk with my friends. And then Miss Sandra came in and she asked me if I was part of it and I said no. And then she told me to become a part of it. I was like, okay. <laughs> so I became a part of it. Miss Giles gave me the papers and stuff. And that's how I was moving around. Mm, how how being in the wrong place at the right time ended up being good for you. Huh? <laughs> so what are some of the skills you gained from participating in RAM? Some of the skills I gained was communication skills. I still like at it sometimes, but teamwork skills. All that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, th- I feel like we all can lack a communication skill sometimes. It's an ongoing um, learning opportunity. Um, what have been some of the benefits of participating in RAM? Well, we got college tours, and I always wanted to be a nurse, but I never knew which college was best for me to go to. So when we went on college tours, I was always there, and I was always trying to see which one was best for me at the time and stuff. So those um, those college tours are helping you think about what, how, and what how you need to pursue that nursing degree. Yes, ma'am. Have you learned about other careers as well? Yes, ma'am. We learned about a welding career, yes. law okay. enforcement. We learned about a lot of careers. I'll just say that <laughs> I can't keep track of. Okay. What would you say to a young person considering participating in RAM? I tell them join. Join, because it's the best thing for you at this school. Join. All right. Thank you, Maya and Alan, for um, sharing your perspective of RAM. Terrific. Um, thank you for that, both of you and Ebony. Um, you're a terrific MC, Ebony. Um, and I think we'll hopefully we'll have some time to uh, circle back with you in a bit um, after we hear from Tori and Becca. And I do want to remind everybody that um, you can use the chat for questions and comments. Um, so please do. And uh, we will uh, have Tori and Becca in the spotlight for the next few minutes. Great, thank you. I'm delighted to introduce Becca Gutworth, who is the Executive Director of School Age Child Care at YMCA of the Pines in Medford, New Jersey. Becca worked with our KIT team through a project we do with NJSAC, the School Age Care Coalition. Um, so thanks, Becca, for being here to share your experience. I, I would love for you to share, before you worked with KIT, how was your program doing in serving children with disabilities? And what differences do you see between then and now in the staff that you serve? So I've been in my position at the Y for about four years now. Um, And when I came in, we were using an outside agency um, that did staff training for about an hour a year. Um, And we run school age child care before and after school programs um, in 14 schools. Uh, About 700 kids we serve and we were getting an hour a year. Um, when I came in, we, you know, kind of continued that for the first year. My background is actually as a special education teacher. So I do have classroom experience and kind of took over a little bit more of the day to day. Um, but it just wasn't enough. I can't get to all my schools. I can't help all the kids. Um, during the pandemic, NJ SAC ran the program with Kit, um, for a year, kind of a long term. We went through multiple sessions and, Um, Kit made a real difference for me in how I present things to my staff. Um, When I was taking my special education classes, they focus a lot on what the IEP or the diagnosis says, and Kit focuses more on what the behavior is telling us. So you don't necessarily need to see the IEP or the diagnosis. You need to look at what their behavior is saying because Um, You know, Tori mentioned earlier the student with Down syndrome that was in her program. Not every student with Down syndrome is going to have the same behaviors, is going to present the same way. So you really needed to look at each child um, as an individual. And Kit broke down the behaviors for us more than the diagnosis or the IEP. Um, 
so that we could look at what the behaviors were saying and focus directly on the best solutions for each individual student. Um, this year, we had the opportunity to now, NJ SAC is presenting some evening sessions, which my staff are able to attend. So we're now getting the staff directly on the sessions with NJ SAC, um, rather than hearing it, you know, secondhand through me, they're hearing it directly, which then gives us the ability to go back and say, you know, what did you notice in this course? What did you learn in this lesson? Um, Philip is the primary presenter that we've been, been hearing from and the staff are looking at each behavior as communication now. So it's kind of given us a common language to use and given staff another way to look at each individual student. Thanks, Becca. There's a lot there. Um, one hour a year is the old timey um, professional development model. Yes. And we're just finding that it just doesn't work anymore. Staff turnover is high. Um, you know, you need information in the moment that's relevant, that's doable, relatable, that has equity involved in it. So um, yeah, that's a very, very good point, Becca. And behavior, 76% of the calls to our Inclusion Sports Center are actually about behavior. That's the primary reason for the call. There may be an underlying need that there usually is that is a disability or is a social emotional need, but it's really the behavior that the provider needs help figuring out how to um, support in a group care environment or a group activity environment. So I and appreciate you bringing those up. Many of the supports that we use um, are with students who don't have developmental disabilities. They're students who are just struggling for whatever reason, um, meeting their own needs. So the, the programs that KIT has offered us have given us ways kind of to approach every student behavior in a new way. And the fact that there's so many resources available online, there's something that we can find for each situation. So if somebody, you know, we had a presentation from KIT, but now we're, you know, three weeks, six weeks down the road and we're struggling with an individual student, there's something online that we can kind of pull down and remind ourselves or look at steps and find a way to kind of meet that student's needs. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent point. Um, I think when I first learned about inclusion, that's what enticed me or what I gained from it was that every child who enters the classroom actually has a unique way they want to participate and has unique needs and one size does not fit all. And, and those things are dynamic. Something that is a disability in one context may not be in another. And so differentiation is really key, but that's not something we normally teach our after school providers. So um, that's a very important part of it. Um, finally, I'll ask you one more thing, Becca, which is um, what do you think other out of school time programs and organizations that support them would really need to know? Is there any key words of wisdom you would offer to other programs? So I think for other out of school time programs, the biggest thing is looking at each behavior individually. Um, Kit uses the phrase behavior, all behavior is communication. Um, and there's some need that's not being met if a kid is having a behavior that doesn't mesh with your program. Um, we have a little boy at one of our schools who does not have any kind of developmental disability, but yet he keeps getting in trouble and he keeps getting in trouble. And I was over at that school last week and we sat down and talked about it and he's just completely, he's a kindergartner and we're seeing more of this with the pandemic where kids were not in the typical preschool programs they were in and they're behind developmentally. And he is just completely overwhelmed by being in the gym with kids in grades K through five. And where some kids thrive on being with their older kids and the older siblings, this child is struggling with that environment and just looking at him as an individual what is the need that's not being met here? And for him, it's just the need for space and a little bit more quiet. So we can, you know, move him to the cafeteria and let's, you know, pull out a group of kids who wants to play cards. So I think trying to focus on what the behavior is um, rather than what the disability or diagnosis is with a student and you're going to serve all of your kids better. Um, and then when we're looking at people who are kind of funding our programs, I think it's important to remind them in, in the schools, there seems to be more funding going for um, some of the special ed classrooms. And I talked to parents who their child's in a group, you know, a classroom with four kids and three staff members or five kids and five staff members. And that doesn't happen in the out of school time program. You know, we're taking the kids and not getting that same funding and support. 
Um, and that's difficult because it's hard to meet those needs with two staff for 30 kids. So, you know, trying to make sure um, from our bosses, we're letting them know we need more staffing. And yes, maybe it means less profit this year, but we need more staffing in order to keep our programs running in order to support our staff, because we're going to continue to lose staff members if we're not supporting our staff members. So, you know, kit programs especially can support the staff members so they feel like they have the skills to better assist the kids in the program. It becomes a much more enjoyable program for everybody involved um, if the staff members are able to support the students better. That's a great point. That's an area where I would love to see more research. We know anecdotally that providing more professional development and staff in investment in that way leads to better retention, but there's not a lot of research around it yet. So I would love to see some real data on that, but we've, we definitely see it in our work that when people feel like you've prepared them and you're helping them and supporting them, they will stay in the job longer. And that, that turnover rate is really high right now. Um, great. Thank you so much, Becca. It's a delight to work with you and others in New Jersey, and I'll turn it back to Kathleen. Thank you. Um, there's so much that all of you, both of you panels have brought up. And so I think, um, why don't we bring everybody back in the spotlight? Um, Ebony, Maya, Alan. Yep, okay, good. Um, and I'll remind folks that uh, the chat's open for questions and comments. Sometimes you have a question or comments are great. And if it's a question that can be answered right in the chat by one of our um, speakers, then they can do so, or we can bring it into the conversation. Um, so that's open for everybody. Um, I had a question around, and you were kind of uh, touching on this a little bit in, in both the conversations, but just sort of zeroing in on the characteristics of the out of school time space for the goals, um, both of of what you're what you're doing with your training and your work, Becca, but also the the ramp program, like um, which happens in the out of school time space. So, the out of school time space, um, I think that there's unique benefits and value to it, but also possibly challenges um, and if anyone, and not everybody has to answer this question, but I would love to hear from anybody who has a thought, either, of, you know, how does that impact, how does the unique characteristics of the out of school time space present um, benefits and challenges for the work um, that you're doing? And for Alan and Maya, that's um, like, you know, what was it about that program being in out of school time not in school time classroom space that made it a, a particular difference for you or or made it particularly challenging for you. Um, so that, you know, anyone who wants to kind of jump in, go I'll for it. Jump in. Um, I think it's a it's an opportunity um, for us to intentionally focus on the specific population um, for youth with disabilities. Um, we've seen in IEL's trend, youth transition report that the trends show that there are continued disparities in access and earning power and employment for youth with and without disabilities and programs like RAMP, I think, are programs that can be intentional about helping to reduce those disparities um, and, and helping youth to understand what they're, understand and acknowledge that they have a disability. Um, and also for the parents to understand what it is to have a disability and what resources are available. Um, so I think that's the benefits, but I think the challenge is really just um, making sure that the, the people that are implementing the program have the knowledge and the skills. So I think it's increasing that capacity building across. So my programs are primarily a K-5 program. And I think the benefit is that for some of our students um, with disabilities, this is their opportunity for a mainstream environment because it's not a program that's, you know, just for um, students with special needs. We're operating, you know, it's, it's basically after school childcare. Um, but we like to think of it as a value added program. So they're getting arts and crafts and they're getting sports and games. And this is their opportunity to not only be with peers, but also be in a mixed age grouping. So they're learning 
from modeling what the older students do. Um, they're getting a little bit more of a chance to interact in a low demand program. So they're not having to sit at a desk and do a math problem and then switch to reading a half an hour later. There's far more personal choice. So they have the opportunity to kind of explore um, their own interests and needs. And at the same time, that K to five large environment can very much be overwhelming sometimes. Um, and our staff are not, they're not as trained as the staff at the school. You know, we, we have staff from 16 to 70 years old. So, you know, you're coming from, some of our kids are coming from a classroom of four students with four staff members, you know, a teacher, three one-to-ones or a teacher and assistant and two one-to-ones and they're getting pulled out for therapy for this or that. And then they're coming to us um, and it's on us to try and support them in the same ways when we just don't have, you know, the experience um, or the education to do that. So there's a challenge in being able to provide them um, the opportunity that's gonna be most beneficial to them. Those are great. I wanna add one more thing, which is that inclusion in out of school time or in, in school time benefits both kids with and without disabilities. So the impact is on both sides. And in fact, what the research shows is that kids without disabilities benefit even more from inclusive settings. So I think that's an important feature. And in, in out of school time, we have such a rich opportunity for friendships and social skills development and kids exploring interests and feeling successful at something and getting to do something they enjoy doing that may be very different than their in-school experience. So it can be a real social esteem boost. It can help um, generate relationships that then can translate into the school day when kids are more segregated, even when there's an inclusion model happening. So I think the out of school time just has such rich possibilities for um, personal and skill development and helping kids realize their full potential. Yeah, thanks for that, Tori. Um, I agree, absolutely. Um, and Love to hear from Maya and Alan. How did that, how does this play out? How did this play out in your program experience and for Maya still happening um, about the difference between this being an after school versus um, school? For me, it was, it was during school for like an hour okay. or 30 minutes. Yep. Um, but for me, it was it was just a fun time. It was really we all got a chance to talk about what we wanted to do in life, or you know what we were thinking about uh, uh, wanting as a career. And the our ramp coordinator talked to us about um, how we could start the process of you know, getting information for it. And we just uh, brainstormed with each other about every, any idea that we had. So it was very inclusive and very like, you know, it wasn't like a one-on-one, -on -one. it was everybody talked amongst each other. So it was very much a, like a group uh, discussion. Mm -hmm. So it, it was great for me. Maya, what are your thoughts? For me, it was really good because we live in like a small area. Therefore, we don't really have that much transportation. But when we go places to school, provide transportation and it provide my peers trans transportation. Yeah. Did you say provide your parents transportation? Peers. Peers, okay. Got it. So most of them, their parents don't really well, they work really late, so mm -hmm. they don't have a way of getting there and getting back. Mm -hmm. Right. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and so one of the things that, and uh, I know that you you all are having a conversation in the chat about IEPs, and, and um, that's a good um, sort of policy slash financial solution to some of these issues because I it, my understanding is if something is in an IEP then it needs to be actually 
available and made available financially for the young person. So something to definitely look into. And I hope um, that the if this is something that you want to dig into and learn more about, we'll make sure that you have a connection to Tori and others that are talking in the chat. And thanks, Anne, for your um, comments there. I think also one of the things that we like to think about on these calls, because we are a, a funders group, is um, what are the implications for philanthropy? And um, we brought the, that up. I think, Becca, you brought that up a little bit, and I appreciate that. Um, and some of the things that I've heard um, in terms of funders, uh, if you are a funder who's funding on the program level to understand that um, there is a cost implication to be able to fully uh, provide the services and the experiences for young people in an inclusion model that Tori and Becca have talked about and Alan and Maya have talked about um, actually experiencing. And that has to do with um, cost for training for staff. And then also, not just that though, it's also, I heard Becca um, talk about staff ratios, which means that that would be a shift in perspective for what an out of school time program actually costs all the time, over time. Um, and I think that that is something that is super real um, and people need to, to be grappling with. Um, another thing that I heard was around um, research and gaps in research um, and particularly that, that research on um, the impact of professional development and increasing um, staff ratios on staff retention, which everybody knows is going to save money in the long run and be better for young people um, and staff. Uh, so that would be another thing to think about if you're in the, um, if you have the practice of funding research um, and really, and that's some, some connections that um, we should take up and, and keep trying to dig into as well. Um, so anything else that anyone um, on the panel wants to bring up that you'd like to tell funders um, about the ways that they can more effectively support the work that you're doing, I'm going to open that question up. I I like to, um, I mean, I, I agreeing with the capacity building um, piece, like the um, funding for that, but I want to bring up the importance of creating a space that honors youth voice and a place for all you to gain skills and to set them up for success and how to engage families. Um, and in providing these service work, like Maya mentioned, it is um, it is difficult in those rural, rural areas for transportation. That's always a support, a support that's needed for our youth. Um, and while we're providing these skills to the youth, it's important that we recognize that they are a part of a family. So the youth is learning skills, learning trainings, but what resources do the families need as well? Um, particularly for youth with disabilities, we know that vocational rehabilitation agencies provide services and resources for youth and individuals with disabilities, but where are those VR agencies located? How do we ensure that the youth have access to those agencies to get the services that they need? So just highlighting that to make sure that um, everybody has access to the services. I would like to share um, also here in Georgia. I'm sorry, hold up a minute. Maya, will you turn your volume down so that we're not echoing? There we go. Thank you. <laughs> Maya and I are pretty close in proximity, so whenever I'm speaking, it echoes through her speaker. But um, here in Georgia at our ramp site, we do have the um, privilege of, of partnering with, um, oh goodness, it's a GSIP. It's um, Georgia Committee on Employment for People with Disabilities, who helps to support some of the, the funding for um, for our ramp program. In turn, the transportation costs that sometimes the schools will need assistance with. If those students are also a part, like Ms. Ebony said, of the vocational rehabilitation program, there's some funds that we can help to support the transportation costs. So um, partnerships with VR is, uh, you know, they, they are 
extremely important, um, especially in those rural areas. And, you know, we take the liberty here in Georgia to make sure that the parents are aware of VR and their services and what they have to offer. So um, I would just like to say we are trying to build those, those connections back and um, ensure that parents and students and school staff are aware of the services that book rehab provides for our youth. Thanks. Um, oh, Sandra, will you introduce yourself as long as you're here? And I'm glad. I'm sorry. That you yourself. No, I'm, I'm glad. Sandra I'm McBride. I'm the ramp coordinator for um, our Georgia site. Perfect. Um, and uh, okay, I love that. And I, and also the um, one of the themes that comes up for me as I listen to you all answer that question is, and this is something that. Um, we talk about a lot in our funder conversations and, and throughout the impact group is the, um, the need to just basically listen to providers and young people when they say what it is that they need, because you all are the experts on what you need. So I heard, um, and I'm glad you brought up families because we didn't really get a chance to dig into that too much, Ebony, but it's a critical part of everybody's success. And there are, um, there are supports and um, and enrichments and connections that um, really are important and critical to young people's success to bring in families that cost money. Um, and so how to consider that um, as part of the cost of supporting an out of school time program. And then also what Maya brought up and Sandra about transportation, which is something that um, comes up quite a bit and is certainly not, you know, very glamorous, but is absolutely critical to the work um, and the experiences actually happening. So I'm glad that you all brought that up because I think just, you know, listening to you, taking you all um, at your word and then um, doing as much as we can from the funder perspective to provide the resources that, that you are the expert on and that you say you need. Um, so I am, I, I know that we've got um, some live questions in the chat and I'm gonna let the folks on the, on the panel and anybody else who has anything to say about these questions, answer them right in the chat because I know we're running a little bit out of time. Um, I want to thank um, everybody who's come on today and also particularly um, thank Tori and Ebony, um, thank Becca and Alan and Maya and Sandra um, for sharing your experiences with us. And um, I think that you've given us a lot to think about. And I am really, really grateful um, for you spending some time today with us. And I am going to uh, turn it over to Rebecca, my co-facilitator, to close us out today. And thanks as always, and I hope everybody has a good weekend, but don't leave yet because Rebecca's got some stuff to say. Okay, thanks so much, Kathleen, and for, to all of our speakers. It was a really great conversation, generative, and good to see all the questions and potential for uh, research and policy um, implications in the chat. I see a lot of opportunities for investment, so we're going to talk about that more with the funders in this community. Um, so I wanted to just share next month, our, our monthly con field convening call will be on February 17th, uh, same time from 12 to 1 Eastern, and we're going to dive into policy opportunities in 2023 and uh, what, you know, folks see coming up for the out-of-school time field. So please join us next month on the 17th. Uh, the other thing I wanted to bring to your attention, we've been talking about the Power of Us Workforce Survey for the last year, uh, led by American Institutes for Research. It's a huge national study on the youth field's workforce, which includes folks doing inclusion work, after school, summer, camp programs, museums, libraries, juvenile justice, one-on-one um, -on -one mentoring, all these types of settings that young people are engaging with adults, both paid and volunteer. Just wanna share that that survey has been extended through March 31st, 2023, which is great. And it means we have uh, just a few more months to boost those numbers and get better data for our fields because we know workforce challenges is a number one priority um, for programs out there. Um, so I just want to make this an urge to you all to share this with your staff and volunteers, share it with your grantees to share with their staff and volunteers. And in particular, we really want to reach the part-time direct service staff to make sure we hear their voices around their experiences on the job. Um, 
And I'll throw my email into the chat in case anyone wants to follow up or wants more information. If you go to the um, powerofussurvey.org uh, website, there's a new tab called Survey Responses. And there you'll see a map of, this, of the country updated weekly on Mondays to show you the distribution of responses. And you'll see different colors. And so if you're in a state or have access to folks in a state with the lighter green color, we need your help to get more responses there. So you know this is a collective field effort and hope you'll join in to help boost our survey data because we know this is gonna be important to funders, it's gonna be important to policy, um, leaders and practitioners to better support the folks doing this work. So that's my plug to you all. I um, want to thank again our speakers. Thank you for being here with us today and hope to see you next month.